Dr. Fali and your YouTube psychic. Card of the day. Readings. Unboxings. Your daily source for things arcane. All right, again, I have to give you a uh, trigger warning. We are still talking about the suspects in the Jack the Ripper case. Yes, girl, we are still going, and we have a few more to go. So, um, if this is something that will trouble you, then I would suggest skipping this video. If not, please enjoy. Yes, you read that correctly. This is Prince Albert Victor, Duke of Clarence and Avondale. Now, this is one of those that sort of teeters on uh, crackpot conspiracy theories, but we'll give it a whirl. So, uh, one recurring figure and favorite of fictional accounts of the Whitechapel murders is Prince Albert Victor, the Duke of Clarence and Avondale. At least two major films, Murder by Decree 1979 and From Hell 2001, center on this royal family's suspected role in the Whitechapel murders. Prince Albert, called Eddie by friends, was Queen Victoria's nephew and was considered slow as a child and well into adulthood. During his life, Prince Albert Victor was peripherally involved in a number of scandals involving prostitution, including the Cleveland Street scandal, in which he was suspected to have been a client at an all-male brothel. He also was blackmailed by a couple different lower-class prostitutes in his lifetime and is suspected to have contracted some low-grade venereal disease. None of the scandals that arose during his lifetime, however, could rival what he would be accused of long after his death. The Duke of Clarence was not put forward as a public ripper suspect until 1962 when author Philippe Julian alluded to rumors about the Duke of Clarence in a biography of Prince Albert's father, Edward VII. One ripper theory posited that in an article by Dr. Thomas E. A. Stowell, contends that Prince Albert himself carried out the rampage after contracting syphilis from a Whitechapel prostitute. Stoll later denied that he made that accusation, but died of old age before he could be questioned further about the theory. One of the most famous theories, which first appeared in Stephen Knight's Jack the Ripper, The Final Solution, is a conspiracy including multiple people to cover up the Duke of Clarence's Ill illegitimate child. The Duke was supposed to have secretly wed a poor Catholic shop girl named Annie Crook and then sired a son. The plot to silence anyone aware of the child included Queen Victoria, Prime Minister Lord Salisbury, the London Metro Police, Walter Sickert, and a number of Freemasons. This tale was first told to night by Joseph Sickert, son of painter Walter Sickert, who later admitted that the story was a fabrication. Most of the th theories surrounding Prince Albert have been debunked due to documented evidence that he was not in London at the time of the murders, and likely s never suffered from syphilis. Theories about purported members of the quote-unquote royal conspiracy, such as Walter Sickert, also have been dismissed as highly improbable, but continue to inspire the imagination and artistic expression. This one is a bit more feasible, however, still probably unlikely. Uh, this is James Maybrick. He was a well-to-do cotton merchant from Liverpool. He did not become a ripper suspect 
until over a hundred years after his death in 1992. Another Liverpoolian named Michael Barrett brought what he claimed was the diary of Jack the Ripper into public eye, which readers agreed was written from Maybrick's point of view. Born in 1838 to William and Susanna, James Maybrick was one of six brothers. As an adult, James recruited his brother Edwin as a junior partner in Maybrick and Company Cotton Merchants. A life of commerce included traveling between the American South and England for business. He married a member of Southern High Society, Florence Flory Chandler, in 1881, who bore him a boy, James, and a girl, Gladys. The family split, split their time between Norfolk, Virginia, and England until business prospects declined in an economic recession, and the family settled in Liverpool for good in 1884. It was not long before clouds began to form over the Maybricks and the impressive Battle Creek house where they lived in luxury. During his early years in Virginia, back in the 1870s, James had contracted malaria and treated it with a combination of strychnine and arsenic, which, believe it or not, was a fashionable drug for men of James's station at the time. He continued to quote-unquote treat himself with these powders over the years, and the habit likely contributed to his early grave. Most likely, if you're taking strychnine and arsenic girl, that's like death. <laughs> uh, uh, before that point, however, his addiction to arsenic manifested in mood swings, paranoia, and at least one black eye for Flory about a month before Maybrick's death. In addition to tensions in the house, sometime in 1887, Flory discovered that she was not James's first wife. That distinction went to a woman named Sarah Ann Robertson. But Flory found James still paid her frequent visits in her home on the outer edges of Whitechapel. Not long afterward, Flory began her own affair with a cotton broker named Alfred Brierley. Maybrick died of arsenic poisoning in 1888. Maybrick's brother soon raised alarms about Florence's infidelities and the unhappy marriage between Florence was brought to trial for his murder. She was convicted of on the evidence that she had arsenic containing flypaper in the weeks leading up to her husband's death, as well as the word of character witnesses, James's brother and the other servants. She was released from prison in 1904 and lived until 1941. Maybrick's diary never mentions Maybrick by name. However, details in the text make his supposed identity clear. The murders are triggered by his discovery of Florence's affair and are described in vivid detail, though not always in accordance with forensic reports. The diary's authenticity is still subject to debate among ripperologists. Now, it's not uncommon for there not to be pictures of the quote-unquote lower-class people. They just couldn't afford to have their picture taken. Uh, this is uh, about Charles a Allen Lockmere, or better known as Charles Cross. Take a closer look at the story of discovering Mary Ann or Polly Nichols's body, and you might wonder who were these carmen who found the body in Buck's Row. One of the men gave his name at the Nichols inquest as Charles Cross. 
He is, however, also found in records under the name Charles Lakemere, a 39-year-old driver for Pickford Meats. Cross slash Lechmere, Lechmere, however you pronounce it, was the first to see Polly's body lying in the alleyway, according to newspaper accounts. The second carman, Robert Paul, told a reporter, I saw a man standing where the woman was, meaning he was the second on the scene. Though police let the two men continue to work, Dr. Gareth Norris of Ooh, Aber, Aberystwyth University argues this might be a case of the killer hiding in plain sight. His analysis shows that the path Cross or Lechmere regularly took to work brought him by three of the murder sites as well. Hanbury Street, where Annie Chapman's body was discovered, Mitre Square, the site of Catherine Eddowes' demise, and Dorset Street, which runs past number 13 Miller's Court, ill-fated Mary Jane Kelly's room. Elizabeth Stride was found on Burner Street, near Lechmere's mother's house. Little is known about Cross or Lechmere beyond his discovery of Polly Nichols' body. Uh, records indicate that he may have recently separated from his wife and daughter, but beyond his testimony, we have little more to go on. Had he really just discovered the body when Robert Paul approached? The police seemed to think so. At least one modern scholar, however, attributes to the story to the fast thinking of an opportunistic killer. So we have a few more um, videos of suspects to go, um, but we are almost done and we'll eventually begin our readings. <laughs> so um, bear with me, hang in there, and I will see you in the next video where we will have a couple more uh, gentlemen uh, that we'll be looking at in the uh, Jack the Ripper case. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching today's video. Don't forget to subscribe to my content and like this video. Want more? Feel free to order your own personal reading at www.tirthalian.com. That's T-I-R-T-H-A-L-I-O-N.com. Don't forget to click the bell icon so that you're notified every time I upload a video.